Good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> Stop it. All right. I want to welcome everyone who's watching online, uh, whether you're, you know, out uh, enjoying the last summer, you know, kind of hurrah here. It was great. It actually rained today, which is cool. And, uh, you know, you're from the Northwest when you're like, yeah, we needed the rain. And you're in a good mood after that. So what I want to do first is I want to read the scripture. So uh, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. We're talking about the prodigal son. So I'm going to jump right in and start reading. And here we go. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32. It says this. It says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So we went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country and sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will go out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him. He kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the, uh, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants, and he asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look... All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. Can we bow in prayer together? Lord Jesus, thank you that you're a good God and you love us so much. And God, I pray that, that as we continue in, in opening your word, God, that, that you would speak through me. Lord, that you uh, would teach us what it means to, to have an identity in you, a gospel identity. Show us, Lord, what that's like. Yeah, we just give to you this time, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. All right, so I have a confession actually to make today. Can I make a confession to you guys? I have a confession. I am a Canadian. <laughs> actually, 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 hold on, hold on. I am actually a Korean. I'm Korean and South Korean, not North Korean. Some people ask me that. If you're North Korean, you can't get out. You're stuck there. Um, <laughs> South Korean... Actually, you know what? I am an American also. USA. USA. <laughs> oh, man. I'm all these things. It's weird. Um, actually, can I just start over? I am actually this. I'm what's called a third culture kid. Anyone know what a third culture kid is? A third culture kid. Uh, here's the thing. If you grow up in a place like the Northwest, you, it's really, really obvious and apparent that you're different. 
So that was one of the first things that I realized that when, you know, I'm like, these people all look different than me, right? That's, that's, that's how you grow up. And uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily feel like home. You get treated differently. And like, like, no joke, even this year, someone went up to me and did the Chinese eyes to me. Like, it's 2023, people, come on. Like, like that literally happened. But don't feel sorry for me. I used my kung fu on them, and it was amazing. <laughs> Not to perpetuate stereotypes. <laughs> Just kidding. I didn't kung fu anybody. I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor, right? Okay. So what do you do when you don't feel like home in your home? Oh, go, go back to Korea, right? Like go to where everyone looks like you, right? Wrong, right? Because if I go to Korea, I go, they, they, all, they know within two seconds that I don't belong there either, right? I may look like them and everything, but they know right away, you ain't one of us, right? Um, that's what happens, right? Um, so so you, you're, you're not at home in your home. You go to where your, your people are and you're not at home there either. And then what happens is you, dis you discover that you are a third culture kid. It's really, really interesting how that happens. And that's how I grew up. I grew up being a third culture kid. I didn't even know about this term until like... A couple years ago, uh, but that, I was like, that is me, that is me, that third culture kid, that is who I am. Because here's the thing, we all have identity markers, right? Mm. We have identity markers, and today's sermon is all about identity, okay? And we have all these identity markers, and, and uh, can I list some of these identity markers? Identity is such a hot topic in today's world. Identity markers, we have these. I'm going to list some of them here, right? Like geographic location is an identity marker, right? West coast, west side, west coast, best coast, right? Or your social economic status, right? Camus is like a... Yeah, it's Camus, right? Uh, you have national identity markers, USA, uh, race, Korean. Uh, people come up to me, I love BTS. And I'm like, I don't know a single song of BTS, um, but good for you. And that's like the biggest band in the world, BTS. It's this Korean pop, K-pop band is like they sell out. Stadiums, it's crazy, right? Your relationship status is a identity marker, right? Your political affiliation is an identity marker. I'm not going to talk about that and get controversial like the first five minutes of my sermon, no. Education is a big deal, right? Do we have any ducks in the house? No ducks. Beavers? Okay. Huskies? Cougars? It's pretty good. Okay. Paper makers? Yeah. What about Life Bible College pastors? Let's go. <laughs> I didn't think anyone would say anything with there. Okay. You have all these identity marks. Your work background, you could be white collar professional, blue collar worker, um, age, Gen Z, millennials, Gen X, boomers, parental status, sexual orientation, gender. We can talk about personality, temperaments, ENTJ, type A, sports teams are identity markers, right? Triathletes, CrossFit, vegan. We can categorize. <laughs> there's, there's so many identity markers that are out there, right? And they're almost like a deck of cards that we all kind of kind of have there. Um, but here's the thing. The point is that there's a lot of them, right? But I want to talk about three of them today. And we already saw two of them within the, uh, the, pro the story of the prodigal son. Uh, in studying and, and, and preparing for this message, uh, I, I, I looked at a lot of uh, Tim Keller and Charles Taylor. Tim Keller has been one of my best teachers. I encourage you, the late, great Tim Keller who just went to be with the Lord this year, um, one of my best teachers, and I encourage you to read everything that he has and to listen to every single sermon that he has. He's impacted like so many of the pastors on staff. I know Jake's a big uh, Keller guy, and so is, so is, uh, so is uh, Keith. But uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the traditional identity. So we're talking about identity today, right? And we saw the first thing I want to talk about is the traditional identity. Though there are three that I want to hit on this uh, today. So traditional identity, the modern identity, and then finally the gospel identity or the identity that is in Christ. So the traditional identity, let's start there, right? The traditional identity we see in the story of the prodigal son is represented by the old Older son. What is the traditional identity? This, 
the traditional identity, you find yourself within your family. You find yourself within your community. Maybe your nation, your family. It's communal. It's, it's nationalistic. Uh, the heroes of the, the traditional identity are people who deny themselves. They sacrifice themselves for the greater good. For the good of the community. For the gr- good of the nation. For the good of the, the family. These are the heroes of the traditional identity, right? So you're a father. Father, right? You're known as a father, you're known as a mother, you're known as a son, you're known as a daughter first. Before anything else, you're known as those things. And if you do those things well, then you have high esteem in the traditional identity, right? You're fulfilling your role really well if you're, if you're doing those things well. So it's all about who you are within the group. Does that make sense? So you're It's all about who you are within the group, within the community. You deny yourself for the sake of the community. The traditional identity, however, makes an idol out of those things. It makes an idol out of family. It makes an idol out of the community. It makes an idol out of the nation, right? And we see it here in the prodigal son, right? The traditional identity is represented in the older son. We see it um, in this scripture Look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I have been slaving. I've been sacrificing myself and all my desires. I've been slaving. I never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a goat, a young goat, not just a little scrap so that I could celebrate with my friends. This is the older son, right, complaining to the father. He doesn't want to go in the party, right? So he complains, look, I am a good traditional identity person, But when this son of yours, you know, the other son who did all the bad things, squandered your property with prostitutes, you come and you kill the fattened calf for him, right? So this is the traditional identity. For years, this son has been sublimating his own desires for the good of the family. He wanted to go with his buddies. He wanted to do all those things. He wanted to follow his passions, But instead, he denied himself, he suppressed his desires, and he was a good traditional identity son. It doesn't quite lead you to where we want to go, though, right? So let's take a look at the next identity group. So traditional identity, family, community, modern identity is all about yourself, the prodigal son. The modern identity is represented by 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 the younger son, right? And we see that, I can just imagine this happening actually, right? I can imagine like, like the son and like the dad knows the son's tendencies, right? The, and and the, the, the son comes up to the dad and is like, you know what, dad, come here. I've, I've been thinking. I've been thinking. And the, the dad's like, this is going to be good, right? So, you know, I've been, I've, I've been thinking, you know, uh, farming, it's just not my passion, Farming, you know, that kind of stuff, it's just not my passion. In fact, like, working 40 hours a week, not my passion, you know? Like, don't you think that's a lot, 40 hours a week? Like, what's going on? Like, like, and and you know what? The band's going to make it, Dad. You know, the band is going to make it. So, so we're, we're going to move on. Uh, We're, we're we're like, I, 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 he basically, the, the younger son says, says, Dad, you're dead to me. Uh, Give me your money and I'm off, Right? The older son said, neither of these sons wanted the father. They, want, they both wanted his money, right? Um, how did we get to this idea of the modern identity? Let's, can we unpack this a little bit? So how do we get here? Uh, I want to recommend this resource. It's a book uh, by Charles Taylor called Sources of the Self. It's a little bit academic, but, uh, but Sources of the Self, Making of the Modern Identity. It's where I got a lot of this stuff from uh, about about the modern identity. Okay, so how do we get to this spot? Um, Jake actually talked about the enlightenment two weeks ago, which is kind of cool. Uh, but but what, that's how we get to this modern identity, okay? It started with the enlightenment. It started with some of these guys. Look at these faces. John Locke, uh, Rousseau. You determine your moral absolutes. That's what the Enlightenment said. You determine your own moral absolutes. That's what they discovered in the, in the, uh, in the Enlightenment. Then we move on to like rom- romanticism with Rousseau and Schuller, Schiller. We have uh, the way that you, you find yourself, moral absolutes are found through your passions. 
enlightenment. You determine your own, own moral absolutes, and then actually you find them through your passions, and then we get to late, modern, postmodern. It was really hard to find a picture for late, modern, postmodern because they all had weird stuff on there, so that was the most <laughs> innocuous picture I could find. Um, but So we go from the enlightenment to you determine your own moral absolutes and romanticism. Moral absolutes are found through your passions, and then late, modern, postmodern, there is no moral good outside of yourself. In fact, all moral, all moral value is relative. In fact, it's a social construct. So what do you do in postmodernism? You look into yourself to find your own morals, your internal identity. That's where you look. Uh, it's not on the outside from like some archaic tradition. It's all within yourself. Uh, you don't discern the moral good. You don't discern it. You determine it. Modern, uh, that, that's, that's, that's how it works. You, in fact... Um, one of the things with the modern identity is you are you're a hero if you take your traditions and your family and your community and you say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go this way and follow my own passions. That's what the modern identity does. It says, no, no, I'm not going to do the traditional things. I'm not going to follow them. I'm not going to like come in line with that. I'm going to say no, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to follow my own passions. You're a hero in the modern identity if you do that. In the traditional identity, if you do that, you are a villain. That's how it works, right? So these two identities are so, so just contradictory to each other, right? They're, they're very, very, very different, right? Um, that's how it works. Let's look at some of the, the problems with the, the modern identity. Number one, it's contradictory. It's contradictory. Sorry if this is a little bit academic, but we got to understand, we got to understand what air we breathe before we can fully understand where we are in Christ, right? So it's contradictory. The modern identity is actually, it's incoherent. You guys ever have desires that contradict with each other, right? Like you want that great job, you want, you're so ambitious, you want to be ambitious and you want that great job, but you also want a family, right? Those things are warring against each other, right? Like, I'll give you one. Like, I really, I, I try hard to exercise and to be in shape, but I love ice cream. Like, what's up with that? Like, it's, someone said amen to that. All right. Um, why is everything that tastes so good so bad for you? Like, why is that the case, right? And like, I want to be in shape, but, but, but I love ice cream, salt and straws, like the best thing ever. Like, what is going on, right? Um, there's this amazing quote that says this. Francis Bufford says this. says, you are a being whose wants make no sense. They don't harmonize. Your desires are discordantly arranged that you want truly to possess and not to possess. You are equipped for farce and tragedy and not happy endings. Does that not just describe us perfectly and describe this modern identity perfectly? You want these two things and they're at war with each other. So the first thing, the modern identity is contradictory. Next thing, the modern identity is changing. It's unstable. It's always changing for the individual. There's instability there. You're not the same person who you were seven years ago. Like literally, you're not the same person. You guys know that, that almost every cell in your body regenerates every seven years. So you literally are not the same person. <laughs> like physically, you're not the same person that you were seven years ago. Almost every single cell regenerates every seven years. I love this quote by, uh, by Lewis Smedes. It says this. It says, my wife has lived with at least five different men since we were wed. And each of the five has been me. Isn't that a great quote? We change. We're changing. That's who we are. Anyone like, okay, so I'm 43 years old. Anyone look back? When I look back at like when I was 33, I'm like, what an idiot. Anyone else? Like, am I the only one? Right? Thank you. Thank you. Right? Okay. Here's the thing. <laughs> I'm like, that was dumb. Like, what? why would I do that? Right? Um, and then here's the thing. When I'm 53... I'm going to look back at when I'm 43 and be like, what an idiot, you know? Like, so that means right now I'm dumb, I guess, you know. Like, that's what that means. It's changing. We're always changing. Next, 
So the, mo- the modern identity, it's cr- contradictory, it's changing, it's crushing. It's crushing. Um, it's suffocating. It's actually legalistic. When we say that we got to find, follow our own passions, we got to determine our own morality, we got to do all that stuff ourselves, it's, it's, there's too much pressure. It's oppressive. It's actually crushing. We got to do all this stuff on our own. Man, that's just so, that's so much pressure, right? Uh, there's this great movie. Anyone ever see this movie? Okay. For anyone under, uh, under f- and anyone younger than me, uh, you guys seen the movie Creed? Okay, before uh, there was Creed, Creed had a daddy, and his name was Apollo. And there's a better movie called Rocky, actually. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and Rocky is about to fight Creed's daddy, Apollo, right? And he is worried. Like really, really worried, and he's like pacing, and he's walking the streets, and he's worried. He's he he. In fact, he knows he's gonna lose, uh, but the thing is, the. He's like, okay, I'm going to lose, but I just want to go the distance. No one's ever gone the distance with Apollo Creed, so I'm going to go the distance. And then, and then he says this line. He says, "If I go the distance, I can prove that I'm not just a bum from the neighborhood." He's trying to earn it. He's trying to earn it all himself. I got to work hard. I got to do all the training. I got to cut weight. I got to do all this stuff because I got to prove to me and everyone else that I'm not just a bum from the neighborhood. That's what the modern identity is. It's crushing. It's all the pressure, all the weight of you doing it all yourself. It's all the pressure on there. It's crushing. Okay. So it's contradictory. It's changing. It's crushing. It's also culture shaped. Or association shaped. You don't really choose, in fact. The, 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 the time spent, um, it's, it's shaped by our association. You guys ever know that you're the, you're the, you're the average of the f- five closest people who you hang out with, right? You're the average of them. It's really weird how that kind of shapes out. You're, you're the average of your five closest people, right? Uh, your, your income, your political beliefs, right? If, if they got tattoos, you got tattoos, right? If they, if, they, if they like a certain music, you like that certain music, like it's just how it is. Nothing against tattoos or anything, but, but it's just like that's, that's how it is. You're the average of your five closest friends, right? And they shape you, right? So it's not, it's not just you discovering itself. You're shaped by your association, by your culture, by, by social media. Oh my gosh, I was so convicted by the book, um, that book, uh, The Ruthless Elimination in a Hurry, right? I, was, I, I got rid of my Instagram because there's all these, these billion dollar companies who are are spending billions and billions of dollars to, to, to make these focus groups and try to get you addicted to scrolling. And they're really, really good at it, right? Like anyone else, like, like start scrolling and then end up being, man, I just blew 20 minutes doing nothing, right? Like what was I even doing, right? And then it's a 20 minutes there and a five minutes there and a five minutes there, right? It's, 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 it's time shaped by culture. There's there's, uh, there's some countries, man, we just scroll and we scroll, right? Uh, there's some countries that, that stop you from scrolling after a while. And they say, hey, you've been scrolling a long time. Do you want to, like, go do something else? Like read a book or something, you know? Isn't that interesting? Um, some countries, they, 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 so they, the infinite scroll, they stop you on that. And then um, they, there's some countries that turn off the Internet. They turn off the Internet from, like, midnight to, like, Four or something. Like they turned it off. Internet's closed, guys. That's genius. Is that not genius? I think we should implement this right away, right? Um, there's also, you know, the, the paid ads that are in there, and you're, some of them are like for be an engineer, be a doctor, and all of ours are like be an influencer, you know, <laughs> like do, do that kind of stuff, right? Um, create, be a YouTuber, right? Um, that's how it is within the the traditional, or the, sorry, the, the modern identity. We're shaped by our culture. You guys ever hear this quote? Uh, Social media is like the new cigarettes. Man, that's so convicting right there, right? We would never give cigarettes to our kids. Oh my gosh, but we, anyways, I'm gonna stop there. Okay, uh, it's gonna shape you. They're too good at shaping you. Too good at it, right? 
Okay, so those are the problems with the modern identity. And I want to move on to looking at the Christian identity, right? So the modern identity makes an idol out of self and your own passions and your own desires. The, the traditional identity, however, makes an idol out of, of your family and out of, out of uh, your, your, own, your own community and nationalism and stuff like that, right? So we got, we got traditional identity modern identity, and now let's talk about the gospel identity. And before I talk about that, I want to say just a quick caveat. Um, we don't, here's the thing. So most people live in this modern identity nowadays because that's, that's the air that we breathe and everything. But when these people, when we try to talk to these people about Jesus, they think we're trying to save them to this. It's interesting, yeah. We're, when, people, when people in the modern identity, when we try to talk to them about Jesus, they think we're trying to, to save them to the traditional identity. And we're not trying to do that. We're not trying to convert them to the traditional identity. You know, we're not just trying to, like, change someone's sexual orientation or their preferences or, or, or move someone from one political party to another. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to show them Jesus, amen? We're trying to show them Christ. We're trying to show them the, the, the true identity that they can have in Jesus. It's not about being a modern identity person and fulfilling your own passions and desires or seeking the, the good of the family or the good of those things. I mean, some of those things are great. It's about following Christ. So this is the key, right? This is the gospel. Identity in Christ is received. It is not achieved. Identity in Christ is received, not achieved. <clears throat> Here's the thing. Both identities the modern identity and the traditional identity, they try to earn it. One tries to earn it through sacrifice for the family and the greater good, and the other tries to earn it through their own moral justification and, and seeking out their own moral good. Uh, but both tend towards legalism. That's how it is. The idol of the modern family, or the, sorry, the modern identity is the self, and the otter, idol of the traditional identity is family, right? Um, only in Christianity is it freely given. It's not of yourself so that no one can boast. The basis of, how do you say this? So identity in Christ is received, it's not achieved. Let me say it another way. The basis of your identity is Christ's performance, not yours. The basis of your identity is Christ's performance, not yours. Here's the thing. It does have to be earned. It's got to be earned, just not by you or me. Jesus earned it. Amen. So we, so, we, so we put our faith in him. He's the one who earned it. I love, we, we just did a study in Colossians. Colossians 2 has so many things that, that talk about the fact that we are in him, that we've been adopted. We're a child of God. Our identity is in him. We continue to live in him. We're rooted and built up in him. We're brought to fullness. We're circumcised in Christ. We're buried with him. We're raised with him. We're alive in Christ. We're raised with Christ. The can, he canceled all of our debt. It's amazing. So identity in Christ is received, it's not achieved. You can't earn it. You got to just receive it. You got to receive it. I love 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 21. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. What does that mean? Does that mean that Jesus all of a sudden became sinful on the cross? No, that, that, that sin was, our sin, all of our sin was, was put upon him. So that we, in, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is the gospel right there, right? That, that our sin was placed upon him and his righteousness was placed upon us. That's the most beautiful thing, right? So when, when almighty God looks at every single one of us, you know what he sees? He sees a beauty. He sees a, a, a son or a daughter that he's so proud of and, and, and that he's lived a perfect life. That's, that's our God. That is Jesus. He lived that perfect life. He took our place up on that cross. We deserve to be up on that cross, to have nails in our hands and in our feet, to be whipped, to be spat upon, to put a crown of thorns shoved into our, our face. We deserved all that stuff and he took our place for us. That's the gospel. It's received, it's not achieved. 
I love that. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. Okay. Let's look at what Apostle Paul says. I love Apostle Paul. Okay. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Romans is amazing. Some of the, uh, I think women of the word are going or, or went through the book of Romans. And, and man, I love the book of Romans. It's so rich with theology and encouragement. To me, it's the best book of the Bible, right? So immediately, Paul starts off saying this. Paul, a servant of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. He says this. First thing he says is this. I'm Paul, I'm a servant of Christ Jesus, and he is owned by God. That's what it means. That's what it means to be a servant of Christ. You're owned by God. And not, on, not only are you owned by God, you're actually doubly owned. Because you're owned by virtue of creation and you're owned by virtue of purchase. Not only did he create you, but he also purchased you. You're doubly owned, right? We hate that as, as, as uh, modern day people, like hearing, oh, you're owned. We, 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 just, we, we, we just, oh, we don't like that at all, to be owned, right? But that's what it means to be a servant of God, a servant of Christ. That's, Paul sees his identity in a, being a servant of Christ. Next, he sees his identity in being called as an apostle, called to be an apostle. I want to remind us, right, we just looked at the fact that God, uh, that our identity is received and not achieved. Notice here, called to be an apostle. When you're called, someone else is doing the calling. It's not you, it's not me, it's not us earning it. Someone else is doing the calling. Christ Jesus, Jesus is doing the calling. He called Paul to be an apostle, right? So he's the one doing the acting, and we're the one doing the receiving. Finally, set apart for the gospel of God. He's set apart for the gospel of God. What does that mean? In Galatians chapter, chapter 1, verse 15, it says this. It says, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him. You guys catch that? That's kind of a big deal right there. God who set me apart from my mother's womb. Paul, who used to be, what was his old name? Saul, right? He was set apart when? From his mother's womb, right? Now, you have Saul being born, right? And then you have him doing all, this, all these things, right? And then he becomes Paul, right? What is all these things? He, he murdered Christians. He hated Christians. He was an enemy of the church. He persecuted the church, right? You have Saul and then murderer, enemy, you know, persecutor. All of these hated the church. And then he became Paul, right? He was called first. And then he was called. He, and then all the, he did all these bad things. And then he became Paul, right? Some of us out there, we received a call from God. We received a call and, and we, we, we did some bad things. And we think we're disqualified. We, 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 we did some bad things. We had some hiccups in our lives. And we think that God can't use us anymore. Whatever those things are. We feel like we're discarded. We feel thrown away. We feel, we feel like we don't belong here. And we throw in the towel on our whole faith because we did some bad things in our life. Can I just tell you if, if God can, can take a murderer, uh, uh, someone who hated the church, a persecutor of the church, uh, someone who hated Christians, and he, he, if God can take that person... And transform that person into someone who shaped the theology of the entire, our entire faith, that he can do that for you. You know, he can do that for you. But we, but we throw in the towel, we, we deconstruct our whole faith and we, 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 we say, you know what, I did some bad things and God can't use me anymore. Or some bad things happened to me and God can't use me anymore. That's kind of like getting a flat tire and then slashing all the other tires. 
That's like, that's like what that is. Like, no, let's repair that tire and let's go. Okay? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. The word of God says that my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow me. And, I, and they will never perish. And I give eternal life to them. And no one can snatch them out of my hands. The Christian identity is built on Christ. It's received. It's not achieved. It's not about who someone says you are, who culture says you are. It's about who God says you are. It's about whose you are. You're in him. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are grateful that we get to live our lives in you. We get to live our lives knowing that, that you have given us life. We don't have to earn it. And God, I pray and ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that we remember that fact, that, that we are in you, Lord, that you chose us, Lord, that, that you, you have given us new life, Lord. Help us to do that, church. Church, let's, let's stand together and uh, let's sing this song. Let's declare it together.